the experts. Uh, sure. Would be great. Sure. Let me um, let me invite um, Dr. Kieber up. Gary, Gary's been. Uh, he'll give you sort of a summary of everything for us. Could you say and spell your name for us? Uh, Gary Kieber. K E E. Sorry. G A R Y K E E V E R. And your title? Uh, professor of Horticulture. And could you talk to us about um, exactly the extent of the poison to the trees? Well, Steve is probably a better one to address this. He, he's a herbicide expert, but uh, Stephen, why don't you come up? We'll, we'll both talk about okay. this because uh, uh, Stephen, it, it, as I mentioned, is an extension specialist in agronomy and soils, and uh, he has much more experience with the herbicide. Um, Dr. Inlo, if you go ahead and spell your name as well, and we do have a list with everybody's names spelled out for those of you who want it. Sure, my name is Stephen Inlo. Stephen spelled with a PH. Last name Inlo, E N L O E. And Assistant I, Professor, Department of Agronomy and Soils. What's the timeline um, of the trees? How much longer can will they be here? Okay, the question is what's the timeline? How much longer will these trees be here? We don't have a very clear answer on that, and, I, and I'll explain why. Uh, if the herbicide was indeed put down sometime in the late fall, uh, there's been a number of circumstances uh, uh, that have happened uh, that are going to affect that. Number one, uh, with all the toilet papering of the trees and the subsequent rolling, uh, this herbicide uh, is water soluble and has moved uh, into the soil profile uh, beneath the trees. Uh, the live oaks over the, the cold uh, late fall winter months are basically somewhat slow growing, uh, have not uh, been actively growing, and so this herbicide is really active uh, on plants that are very actively growing. So that uh, as the trees uh, um, experience these warmer temperatures, uh, there's plenty of good soil moisture there, they will begin to take up the herbicide through the roots, it will be transported up into the trees, uh, to the leaves uh, where it is active and actively inhibits photosynthesis. Uh, basically, the leaves will then begin to yellow, uh, brown, fall off the tree. Now, that doesn't mean they're dead. Uh, oftentimes, many tree species are very robust and will actually leaf out again uh, following an initial uptake of spike ADDF herbicide. Following that leaf out, uh, since spike is residual and persistent within the soil, the plant roots, the tree roots will again take up more spike. It will be transported to the new leaves and you're likely to see uh, that, that death cycle all over again. Oftentimes, trees can go through multiple flushes uh, for a period of a few years, depending upon the dose of the spike. From my understanding, I think there's about a one to 2% chance that the trees could survive. Are you now ruling that out? Are we sure that they are, in fact, going to die? I know, I know that's a loaded question. <laughs> uh, it's an emotional question. Oh. I always want to hold out hope. Uh, based upon the technical experts I've consulted with around the country, uh, the concentration of spike you know, basically found within the soil uh, would suggest there is a very low probability. How are the university, if anything, what are they doing to save the trees? Okay, what is the university doing? Uh, basically, in situations like this, uh, there's, there's a handful of things that can be done. Uh, the first thing we've done is take additional soil samples to find out the extent of the spike within the soil. Has it moved out uh, into the landscaping? Has it moved out around uh, the trees uh, where it may uh, be, dam be damaging to other vegetation? Uh, so we've taken those soil samples to see that. Uh, we'll get those back uh, pretty soon. Within seven to 10 days. Um, in addition to that, we have uh, acquired activated liquid charcoal, uh, which is used essentially as a sorbent, uh, which will basically bind to the herbicide and will inactivate it. Uh, that has been applied to the flower beds around the base of the trees and saturated or soaked in uh, to the soil definitely beyond, uh, uh, below the depth of, of the herbicide, the soil sampling that we did. So um, that is currently out there and we will be looking to do some reapplications, uh, adding more liquid activated charcoal. When did you put that charcoal down? Yesterday. The, there's such a dense matrix of roots within the granite curving that it would be very difficult to do. Um, 
to take the soil Can you step up to the mic? Oh, oh, I'm Thank sorry. You. I'm sorry. That's okay. the, the question was, did we consider removing the soil? There's a dense matrix of roots within that granite curbing. Uh, we've got approximately 350 square feet of area within that we pour the activated carbon or charcoal in. To take the soil samples, it was very difficult to even push a probe down in that area because of the density of the roots. Now, there, there may be ways to remove some of the soil. Uh, a lot of people have offered advice. They're, they're very willing to help anything to save the trees to increase the chances of survival. One of the things, uh, one of the people that called me earlier this morning has a, an excavator vacuum in which a liquid is applied to the root zone and it uses very powerful suction to remove soil out of the root zone. After things settle down, hopefully later today or, or tomorrow, we're going to get the experts together. We're going to look at some of these suggestions that people are, have proposed and we're going to try to assign merit to them and hopefully be able to take action very quickly. I think that the vacuum, if we are able to take out that soil, would be a very positive thing to do. Now, because the root zone extends well beyond the granite curbing, we would probably have to remove the pavers some distance out from the trees. Really, I wish we had those soil samples back that would give us an idea of how far the herbicide has spread. And then we could move the pavers, and then first we would probably apply that activated carbon to a larger area. Yesterday, we put it just within the confines of that bed around each of the trees. But it's very likely that the herbicide has moved beyond that. It's just at this point, we don't know how far and in what direction. So those are some of the things that, uh, uh, direction that will be taken very soon. Yes, ma'am. Is there a chance that it could affect the trees beyond Tumor's Corner or any plants beyond? Yes, it could. If it moves into the landscape, we've got mag hollies, magnolias, a white oak. If uh, those root zones come in contact with the herbicide, they'll absorb it just like the live oaks have, and there's a very real chance of injury. And when you ask the humans? Uh, no, it's very low. What about, what's the possibility of the toxins going below the soil into the ground water, therefore affecting the water supply? Here, we have somebody here who might be able to address that. Okay. Better, that will be. As a matter of okay. fact, I've, um, I've, Tom McCauley, where is Tom? It's right here. Tom is, um, okay. is in our risk management environmental health area. We might be able to touch on that, sure. and then also maybe Dr. Inlow. But. Sure. Uh, my name is Tom McCauley. I am um, last name M-C-C-A-U-L-E-Y. I'm with the Department of Risk Management and Safety uh, with a focus on environmental compliance and uh, responsibility. Uh, the question was, uh, what impact would it have on the groundwater, potentially? And then the water supply, okay. affecting Auburn Zoo. Okay. So, um, the soils in this general area are very dense. They're um, generally a silty clay or a clay sand or a, a clay soil, so it's very a, a, it's very dense. So the migration of this material through that clay would be uh, uh, would be very difficult. But uh, generally, the uppermost aquifer is greater than five feet below ground surface. So, uh, uh, but for a drinking water well. A groundwater source for drinking water purposes would be in the depth of 150 to 200 feet for a, for a drinking water well. So very, little very little chance to impact the groundwater for uh, drinking water purposes. Can someone talk about the license for this poison? Do you need a license? How do you get your hands on this? Basically, um, you do not have to have a license to purchase this. It is not a restricted use product here in the state of Alabama. Even in big quantities? Yeah, even in, uh, yes, yes. Um, basically, it's not a widely available product. You wouldn't be able to go to your local box store and buy it. You would need to go to an agricultural cooperative or an actual pesticide distributor uh, to purchase uh, Spike ADDF. So no, there, there's not a license required for purchase or use. How expensive is it to buy? I haven't seen a price list lately. Herbicide prices uh, change quite a bit. Um, it's not extremely cheap. So I would, it's, there's some cost involved. I, I don't have a figure right now. I understand it's not um, restricted to purchase. However, if folks do go in and purchase it, is there a law? Do you have to register when you, is there any track record of people who buy this? 
No, there wouldn't necessarily be a track record of people who buy it. The label is the law. So the label is a legally binding document so that it, uh, anything you do with that herbicide that is not in agreement with what the label directs you to do is a violation of federal law. And you may not know this, but I understand you said you can go into stores and get it. Can you get it online? Can you buy it online? I, I would strongly suspect you could uh, find someone uh, online who would sell it. I don't know that for a fact, but it wouldn't surprise me. What is it normally used for? Basically, Spike, uh, ADDF is an herbicide that's typically used for total vegetation control. Uh, it's very effective at what it does, and that is to uh, kill most plants. It, um, it is util utilized widely in rights of way situations for tree control, uh, where we do not, we can't afford to have trees growing. Uh, in industrial situations uh, where they do require bare ground, uh, say around uh, electrical or pumping stations, uh, and along fence rows. Um, in terms of farmstead use, along fence rows would probably be uh, one of the more common uses uh, by the general public or farmers in Alabama. Do, you do, do cities have this? Do city workers need to have something like this? Would city workers... Public um, work, streets? Typically, spike is not utilized in situations where susceptible vegetation that you do not want to injure uh, are. And so city workers would not typically utilize spike uh, anywhere near sensitive vegetation. The label very clearly states do not do that. There are other products they would use. Folks, we've got time for about two more questions. Can I make one yes, here? absolutely, Gary. Just do the two more questions. Please. Spike is not a material that's ever been used on this campus by landscape services or any other entity. So the samples, <laughs> uh, the detection of the chemical up here is not an accident that might, that it, it's not there because of anything that might have occurred on campus as a part of routine activity. If the trees die, are there plans to replace them? Back to me. <laughs> a lot of that will be based on what's involved in replacing them. We've certainly had a number of people all over the region, in fact, even the country. Tree farmers have been calling us and volunteering any help. It's, it's really gratifying to see that. We wanted to get past this first phase, see what the growth of the trees are, and, and, and really take a close look at that. And then based on that, hoping for a miracle, but based on that, um, then we would consult with all the experts and say, you know, is that even feasible due to all the celebrations? If you replant, could a tree even take root? A number of number of horticultural um, considerations there, but, um, but obviously um, uh, people are going to want to know that. And on the website that we have uh, at auburn.edu slash oaks, we'll be making any updates or announcements to let people know um, as we make those discussions. Some folks back here want to know what they can do to help, maybe not rolling or anything they can do. We, um, we have uh, just been talking about that today. Uh, with the president being gone, I certainly don't want to say that we're not going to roll the oaks anymore. <laughs> um, and last night, I don't think we could have stopped it if we wanted to. Um, the question has, has come up a great deal, and, and actually someone responded, and, and uh, I think a number of us were amused by it, that, that um, you know, is this going to stop the, the celebrations at Tumor's Corner? And, and we heard someone say, well, did the Grinch steal Christmas? And, um, um, no, the celebrations at Tumor's Corner actually existed before the rolling of the tree. Not not before the trees, but before they started rolling the trees, they rolled the corner. So uh, there'll be a lot of things we can probably do um, to make those celebrations continue. And of course, if the advice is that we not roll the trees in order to save them, I imagine members of the Auburn family would honor that. Down the road, if you guys want to plant, plant, I know it's hard, but plant new trees, could they grow there? That is definitely horticulture. Last question, Gary. Just gotta get the mayor back. Spike has a half-life of 12 to 15 months. It's likely to be in the soil for at least three.